We are going live on Facebook with Margarita Cheng. We're very thrilled to be here today. Click it on. All right. Okay, we're going live. <laughs> Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Margarita Cheng Show. It's usually called Margaritas with Margarita, although today I'm, and usually I'm drinking coffee. And we are gonna be discussing um, a sort of sad topic, but one that we know is so important for everyone to know about, um, the coping with loss with love. So we know it's important, but for Rita, it's really personal. She recently had a dear client lose her son due to complications of the coronavirus. And of course, as a financial planner, she has to deal with loss quite often with clients who pass along. So normally we do this for 15 minutes, but because this topic is so important and so intense, we're gonna take our time with it. You can also follow along of eight financial steps to take when a loved one dies on Rita's website, www margaritacheng.com, also ritachengcfp.com. This information is on the homepage. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Rita to share the story that inspired this special episode here on February 15th, 2021. And then we're gonna go through the eight steps. So Rita, tell us about just your experience with this situation. Sure, so as you know, yesterday was Valentine's Day and I thought, as you and I discussed, that is a great time to discuss this topic because uh, estate planning is a time to show your love um, for those when you are here and when you may not be here. But what really inspired me to write this article and then discuss this with you is a longstanding client um, lost her son to complications from COVID. Her son was 37 years old. And I thought about gosh, what steps should you take? And so I reached out to US, and US News and World Reports um, because I am a columnist for them. And I said, would it be okay if I wrote a follow-up to estate planning on what steps you should take? And so it is really a tribute to my clients and her son and to all of those you know, who lost a loved one. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit of a backstory. What did happen? Just, you don't have to share all the details, but a little bit so we have some context. So sure, so um, in September, her son was tired and uh, you know, she's a mom. Again, her, you're always a mom. Her baby was 37 and she said, you know what? Um, you need to like go to the hospital. So he did go to the hospital and he did test positive for COVID and he was hospitalized. But what happened is they may have given him too much oxygen. This is September and he, I have a hard time saying was, I'm really sorry was young, healthy, fit. He played rugby, um, coached soccer. He was um, an early childhood educator. And on the weekends, you know, it was basketball, rugby, so many things. So he did have very um, strong lung capacity, but he tested positive for COVID. So he's in one hospital and then they called his mom and said, you know what, it's not looking good and they need to send him to another hospital. And it was at that point where he was in the second hospital from, I want to say the timeline is probably sometime mid-October to early December. And at this time, um, he was in a medically uh, induced coma. There were complications. Uh, the details, I don't really know exactly. Um, but I always am mindful how I interact with clients. And, you know, she sent me a message and I'm very careful how I, you know, I want to practice physical distancing, but I think I am very free spiritual. And I was like, you know what? I saw her. We sat on her sofa. It was more than six feet apart wearing two masks. And I just, this was, I want to say December 27th. She told me her son was still very sick. He was responding. 
um, to her voice, but she was really concerned. Um, fast forward, um, the 6th of January was a difficult day because that was the day of the insurrection, but that was the day when um, she lost her son. And so um, on December 27th, I mean, I spoke to my family. I said, you know, this client has been a longstanding client. She's like family. And I do think that it's important for me to see her. And they're like, okay, mommy, you know best, um, you know, be safe. I sat on the sofa and she said to me, she's like, you know, this means so much that you came to see me and hope I got to be honest. There really wasn't, I mean, the one thing I did is I just sat there and I listened. I didn't really talk a lot. Um, but I just, you know, listened to her story and I provide a little bit of guidance, but I think that meant so much to her. Yeah, no, I'm sure. And, you know, that's one of the special things about your work as a financial planner. It's so personal for you. Everyone is not just a number or another, you know, client, but, but people. And I think that that's really something that I've always admired about you. We've known each other since 2012. And it's a pleasure to be your publicist and work with you here um, as a, doing this new radio show with you because now people get to see you, not just read your articles that are all over on Kiplinger, CNBC, this one that's been on US News and World Report and just so many others. So today we're gonna to share that article, these eight tips that were published originally on US News. Um, and I'm gonna guide you through them. So how to, eight financial steps to take when you loved, when a loved one dies. So step number one is ask for help. Sure, ask for help. I think sometimes, you know, I'm guilty of this myself. The most important thing is, is that when you lose someone, it's okay to ask for help, but you want to make sure you ask for the right help. So asking for help is not a sign of weakness, but what I mean by ask for help is if you're not sure what your loved one has or you don't understand, you know, enlist the help of you know, a family member to help you call maybe a financial planner, estate planning professional, the insurance company, the HR professional, at this point, you don't need to make any decisions. Just ask for help and find out, you know, what you're working with. Absolutely. Step two is protect your assets. So protect your assets. Protect your assets, here's what I mean, is when your loved one has, um, when you've lost your loved one, Protect your asset means that I experienced this not just with my client, but actually with my dad. You do need to report their death. Um, and uh, if they're older and they're receiving Social Security, you know, you're going to contact the Social Security Administration. So we might protect the assets is there are going to be certain things that are frozen, but that's because you don't want the wrong people to get the wrong information. So that means protect their retirement assets, their social security number, and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Their credits for that matter. Yeah, and that's, I think that's what's challenging for people because you don't know exactly what you need to do. And that's again, why a financial planner is really, really helpful. Um, and the, the third tip is find out about existing funeral and burial plans. So this is really important. Um, in the case of my client's son, I mean, he was 37 years old. He was healthy. He didn't um, have a spouse, partner, or children. He had extended community. Um, so, but for people who do have, you know, dependents or children, you know, it's important. I mean, when you're 37 years old, in this case, you know, you don't necessarily think that you are going to die. So we don't, this is a little bit extraordinary, um, but, but this is what my dad told me. And I, and I, um, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but I remember when my dad was very healthy, he was 68 years old. My mom was 54 and my dad came home. He's like, I just want to, you know, I'm so proud of myself. I'm like, dad, what are you proud of? He's like, if I drop dead, everything is taken care of. I'm like, dad, yeah, I know you have life insurance. He's like, no, no, no. What I'm talking about is I prepaid for the funeral plot. And I was like, dad, that's kind of morbid, but he's like, no, 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 no. I don't want to drop dead and have people worry. And my dad was probably a little bit too direct, but I appreciate that he just was all about business, right? <laughs> but he loved us. And I'm not saying, but he loved us. It seemed like it was cold, but that was his way of showing his love. Dad probably could have been a little bit more refined. So what I mean is it's important for you to ask, you know, what it is that person envisioned. It's not that you're wanting them to leave this world, 
But I think a good way to approach it is, you know, what do you envision? It would be wrong for me to decide what you want. So just because we talk about this today doesn't mean it's going to um, happen, but I want to make sure that I'm carrying out your wishes. And so it would be helpful if we at least talk about what you want. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's really critical that everyone has an awareness, even the topics that are so sad, and especially now with the coronavirus being so rampant, it's important because we don't know what's going to happen next. And that brings us to tip number four, when someone, when a loved one does pass, get several copies of their death certificate. Correct. So you're going to want to get several copies of the death certificate, the official copy certified. It's going to have a seal. Now, there are going to be some places that want an original copy and other places um, that will, you know, take a scanned or photocopy. So I tell people you want to get as many as possible. Um, you'll need it for retirement accounts. You'll need it for life insurance. You'll need it for um, Social Security, uh, car, you name it. So it's important to have you know, extras on hand. Absolutely, absolutely. And next you recommend forwarding mail, which has got to be a sad experience, but important. Absolutely. So, um, you know, there are people, unfortunately, this is the information age, meaning information is readily available to everyone. That's good and that's bad. So what you want to do, and you are allowed to do this, you can go to the post office. If that's not appropriate for you to go to the post office, you can go online and request mail forwarding. This way, your loved one's mail goes to you, and you are allowed to do that because you don't want you know, this mail um, filling up in someone's mailbox for someone to just drive by and take it out of the box. Can you imagine? No, that sounds terrible, but possible, right? We just don't know what's possible or what could happen. So being cautious is definitely important, as is tip number six, that it's essential to find the original will and the executor. Exactly. So this goes back to the estate plan. And I know that estate planning is a very difficult topic because for so many reasons, we are dealing when we're not going to be here. So it's important that you, you know, ask the questions and say, you know, where is this going to be located? And I understand that people put them in a safe deposit box. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but with COVID-19 and some banks being closed, you may not be able to access that readily. So you can still keep it there, but make sure that maybe you have a copy as well. Because sometimes people keep things so safe that they don't know where they are. <laughs> I think I'm guilty of that for sure. <laughs> so organize and disorganize. So in, in this case, it's really important to know and to tell someone else, I think. Um, and then what you've been talking about all along, how important it is to meet with a probate and executive and estate attorney, just to get things planned ahead, especially if you have, you know, just a large estate or even if you don't, right? Absolutely. So what people may not realize is, and I am not practicing unlicensed law, but if you have retirement accounts, whether it's IRA, Roth IRA, 403B, 401k, TSP, you got it. They have named beneficiaries and those accounts go directly to your beneficiaries. So they bypass probate. The same thing with life insurance, but there's going to be certain assets that may not um, go directly to beneficiaries. And so that's why it's important that you um, you know, work with an estate planning attorney uh, licensed in your area because he, she, they can advise you um, of the rules in your specific state. Yeah, and to be aware, right? That's, that's yes. key. And so we come to tip number eight out of eight, and that's to locate important financial documents. So tell us what some of those documents are and where we should keep them to, so that others can find, find them when we, they need them. So here's examples of um, financial documents. And I'm a certified financial planner. And I by no means tell my clients that I need to manage all of their money because there are going to be some situations where it's not appropriate. Meaning if they're at a current job, their money needs to stay at their job. Maybe they have a product that is proprietary and needs to stay at another firm. So I think the most important thing is for people to take an inventory of what they have. And I understand this can be really sensitive, especially if you're an adult child asking your parents, because your parents might think, or your grandparents, your loved ones may think, well, they're asking this because they just want to know how much money I have. 
And I don't think that's the case. I think it's really important to know what you have, uh, take inventory and um, inventory of retirement accounts, um, bank accounts, uh, investment accounts, and you know what, also insurance policies. Um, the other day when I was with another client, their mom had um, disability insurance, as she should, life insurance and cancer insurance, but some of that insurance was, uh, the premiums were um, paid via payroll deduction. And you talk about adding insult to injury, we did report the death. I know we did, because I was on the phone, I took notes, but somehow there was a disconnect and the family was getting notices that the premiums were lapsed. So this is what I mean, inventory of your bank accounts, investment, retirement, and insurance policies. Um, and insurance doesn't just mean life insurance, but also homeowners, um, auto, so property casualty and so forth. Yeah, you know, all of these tips are so critical and confusing, especially when you're emotionally charged to the death of a loved one. And that's again, why it's so important to have professionals on your side, someone like Margarita Cheng. Um, and that's also why we are writing a book, Diary of a CFP Pro, where you're, especially for women, helping them flex those financial muscles. And because we're delivering this information, of course, it's on your website at margaritacheng.com. But in the book, there's going to be worksheets so that people can follow along. And as we roll out every Friday, a new podcast, today's our special episode, but every Friday, 15 minutes, Margarita's with Margarita at happy hour um, DC time, where Margarita is, East Coast time. Um, we're going to be sharing some of these terrific tips, and then people will be able to follow along in the book that Incandescent is publishing for you this year. So thank you so much for your time today, Rita. Thank you for taking us through these eight steps for this very difficult conversation. And any th last thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? Well, thank you so much for having me. And just remember that estate planning is love. It's demonstrating your love. So we plan for those that we love and care about most. Excellent. So being in love, even when you're suffering with loss, uh, that is today's topic of the show. You can watch it again on Facebook Live and also on margaritacheng.com and Incandescent Radio. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer of Incandescent Radio and Incandescent TV. Thank you so much, Margarita Chang. We will be back with you on Friday with another important topic. 15 minutes is all you need for a little information to flex those financial muscles. So thank you all. We will talk to you soon.